Can we now turn our attention to renal tubular defects? And after this, we're going to talk about renal tubular acidosis. So prob all of these are problems with the renal tubules, as you can tell from the name. So the first one is Fanconi syndrome. Fanconi syndrome, we're actually basically just going to go down from proximal tubule and work away along all the way around the tubules and see all the problems that can occur. So proximal tubules has a problem with, uh, that we call Fanconi syndrome. Now, Fanconi syndrome is due to impaired reabsorption, and that's one of the key functions of the proximal convoluted tubule is reabsorption of water and different solutes. So if you have impaired reabsorption in pretty much of basically every single solute, you can have increased secretion of all of these, and that includes things like glucose, phosphate, and bicarb. Okay, so what effects are going to happen? When, I with the, when you think about this, just think about the acid base and electrolytes affected for all of the ones we're going to see. And especially, we're going to want to think about potassium. You're going to want to think about uh, calcium. And that's pretty much it. And in this case, in Fanconi syndrome, think about phosphate. So, what will pH be? Will there be increased or decreased blood pH? And that is, will there be an acidosis or an alkalosis? That's the question. Now, as you can see, there's decreased reabsorption of bicarb. So you're going to get an acidosis. And what this is, it's going to be a metabolic acidosis. Remember, metabolic acidosis is when the acidosis results from a renal origin. Okay, so we have to get a metabolic acidosis due to decreased bicarb reabsorption. And then I told you, there's decreased phosphate reabsorption. So you have hypo phosphatemia and this can be a problem because it can lead to osteopenia and the reason for this is you're going to increase your bone reabsorption to compensate for that low phosphate so you're going to break down your bone to increase blood phosphate but that's going to lead to weakening of your bone and that's osteopenia okay, next is barter syndrome as you can see barter syndrome is a problem with the loop of Henle here so the next ones are all pretty much going to be problems with the main transporter. So Barter syndrome, the main transporter in the loop of Henle, is this sodium potassium two chloride cotransporter. So what's going to happen? What effect? What effects are you going to see? And the easiest way to think about this is what, what, what drug do we give that makes it pretty much the same effect? What drug do we give that makes a defect in this transporter? Well, if we give a loop diuretic, we're going to block this transporter. So it's going to look like the same thing. It's going to have the same side effects as that drug, as the loop diuretics. So I told you, look, think about the pH. What will the pH be if you give if you have Barter syndrome? Remember, same thing with loop diuretics. You're going to get more sodium in the collecting ducts. That's going to, I say, they're going to be inside the collecting ducts. And they're going to go out. They're going to get re reabsorbed. They're going to be secreted in place. H plus is going to be secreted for that charge balance. So you're going to be losing H plus. So you're going to get a metabolic alkalosis. Okay. Same thing as you see in the chronic, in the loop diuretic use. We're going to see increased blood pH. Okay. What will happen to the potassium levels? Well, it's going to be the same idea. Again, the word chroma here, but we also get that potassium exchange for that sodium so you're going to get hypokalemia okay and then what about calcium I told you to think about calcium as well how will calcium change well remember in loop diuretics loop diuretics will increase urinary calcium and thus cause decreased calcium in the blood that's hypocalcemia remember that's due to that decreased potassium intake so there's decreased back leak and so there's less calcium paracellular reabsorption okay next is Gittleman syndrome so Gittleman syndrome is in the distal convoluted tubule and the main transporter here was that sodium chloride transporter co-transporter in the distal convoluted tubule so what drug was it that blocked this transporter remember it was the thiazide so it's going to look like chronic thiazide use so how is the pH going to look like well honestly pH remember Diazide loop diuretics do the same thing. You increase the sodium here. So you're going to get the same thing. You're going to get metabolic alkalosis. You're going to get hypokalemia. And how's calcium going to change? Well, this one, let's actually just only change this. 
graph. Let's go back. How will calcium change in thiazide use? Remember thiazide's block here. We said decrease sodium. So now there's going to be increase of this sodium going this way because of the concentration gradient. So now we get increased reabsorption of calcium, okay? So if you get increased reabsorption of calcium, you get hypercalcemia here. So you can see Barter syndrome, Gittleman syndrome look pretty similar. But the main difference is that Barter syndrome gets hypocalcemia, Gittleman syndrome gets hypercalcemia. Next one is Little syndrome. Let's erase everything now. Little syndrome, there's, there's two. We have Little syndrome and SAME at the collecting tube. You'll SAME is uh, it's a abbreviation. I'll tell you what that means. Little syndrome is due to overactivity of sodium reabsorption channel in the collecting tubules. So this sodium channel is working extra much, it's working too much. Okay. What, what hormone is responsible for activating this channel? Do you remember what hormone acts in this collecting duct for that sodium reabsorption? Remember it's aldosterone. So this is going to be pretty much the same presentation as hyperaldosteronism, except that aldosterone is pretty much undetectable. So same questions as, as I have before. What is the pH? What is the pH and what's the K levels? Okay. Do you too much of this? Well you have to send back H plus and K. I did tell you you're gonna keep seeing this again and again and literally again and again. So decrease H plus in blood, you have acidosis. And then you have decreased Potassium in blood, you have hypokalemia. Okay, and then because you're increasing so much of that sodium reabsorption, so so much sodium in your extracellular fluid in your blood, you're gonna get hypertension. Remember sodium. Remember water is gonna follow that sodium, and um, you have all that sodium increased osmolarity in the blood vessels in the extracellular fluid, so you're gonna get increased blood volume, increased blood pressure. Blood pressure. Now, how would you treat this? What was the diuretic, what was the medication that we used to block that sodium channel? Remember the medication acting in the collecting ducts to block that sodium channel were the potassium sparing diuretics. And I told you there's potassium sparing diuretics, diuretics that directly block the channel and there's potassium sparing diuretics that block the aldosterone receptor. So which one would you use if you had to choose one? Well, remember the fact that this is going to be overactive sodium channel so you don't even need aldosterone okay this is overactive even without aldosterone so if you're blocking that aldosterone receptor it's still going to be super overactive so you need a directly blocked that sodium channel and the medication that does this is amiloride so amiloride is a potassium sparing diuretic and it's one of those that directly blocks that potassium channel and that's the medication you need for little syndrome all right finally we have same which was syndrome of apparent mineral corticoid excess and so this is due to uh, overactive mineral corticoid receptor so something like aldosterone and that's due to excess cortisol which activates the receptor so i need to explain this in the cell we normally have cortisol but it's normally and cortisol activates this receptor okay cortisol, cortisol acts on this receptor but in the cell, there's normally a, there's normally an enzyme called 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. You know, just kind of recognize the name 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, and that will convert cortisol into cortisone. And cortisone does not act on this receptor here. Okay, does not act on this receptor. Cortisol does. Cortisol does not. Okay, but in same in this syndrome, this enzyme doesn't work. So you don't get cortisone. You get cort you just have you're stuck with this cortisol, which acts on this receptor, and it causes overactivity. And it's gonna be the same idea as little syndrome. You're gonna get too much of that sodium reabsorption in exchange for for the H plus and the K. So same presentation. It presents the same. How how does it present? Remember, it presents with acidosis, hypokalemia, hypertension. And the way you treat this is you have two ways. One, you treat it with potassium sparing diuretics that block that mineral corticoid receptor. Or you can give them corticosteroids. And what's going to happen? Why would you give steroids, which is basically cortisol? Because if you're giving steroids, it's all about that feedback loop, okay? If you give steroids, you're going to 
decrease endogenous production of endogenous cortisol production. So if you give steroids in the blood, you have a bunch of steroids floating around the blood, they're going to go to the brain, and they're going to shut off that, cord that steroid production. So now there's going to be decreased endogenous production from cells of steroids. So you're going to take that off. Okay, so again, presents the same as little syndrome. You create them with potassium sparing diuretics or with steroids. Now one last thing is how do you remember all these syndromes, all these names, which is super confusing. Just think about it in order of the tubules. The first one is Fanconi. So Fanconi is first, Fanconi first. And after that, the rest of them are in alphabetical order. So next comes Barter, which is B. Next is G. And then finally, you have Little, L, and Same. So just you have to remember that Fanconi is first, and then the rest go in alphabetical order. Barter syndrome, Gilman syndrome, Little syndrome, and then Same syndrome. Okay. And these two are very similar. They just have slight variations. One is overactivity of the channel itself, one is overactivity of the receptors, which will activate the channel. I also want to add that there's these are many different hereditary defects associated with these tubular defects. So it can be autosomal defect, dominant, and autosomal recessive. I've, I've omitted these because I think they're pretty low yield. Consult first aid if you really feel like you need to memorize this and you need to know everything. Okay, now we go to renal tubular acidosis. And there's going to be a disorder of renal tubular exchange leading to non-anion anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay. So you can get acidosis either in defects in your hydrogen secretion or your bicarb reabsorption. Okay. Now there's three locations where this can happen. First one is, is the distal renal tubular acidosis. So... Distal, the thing that happens, remember, you have H plus secretion, okay, and this is when it fails. If you do not have H plus secretion by your alpha intercalate cells in the collecting duct, then H plus is going to stay in the blood vessels and it's going to cause acidosis. Now, my question for you is, will urine pH, pH be high or low? Well, higher than normal or lower than normal. Well, it's going to be higher than normal, and normal is going to be around five, less than 5.5. And it's going to be higher than normal because you're not getting H plus in the urine, so it's not going to be acidified. Now, my other question is, what will serum potassium be? Well, remember that sodium has to go out, but if this isn't happening, what? how do we get sodium into the, into the blood? Well, you have to kick out potassium, right? So you're going to have decreased... Potas serum potassium because you're kicking all that potassium out into the tubules because you can't exchange this H plus for it and that's the whole problem here the second one is the proximal renal tubular, tubular acidosis so that's here so would it be a problem with the H plus secretion or bicarb reabsorption based on your knowledge of the renal physiology well, remember bicarb reabsorption is what happens here so would it be an overactivation or a failure well, if it's an acidosis, that means you're not getting enough bicarb into the blood. So it's failure of bicarb reabsorption in the proximal columnar tubule. That's a proximal RTA because it's proximal to the glomerulus. This is type 2. So how will urine pH be? And this one's a tricky one because you might think there's extra bicarb in the urine, so urine pH is also going to be elevated. But urine pH is actually going to be less than 5.5 because eventually your urine is going to be basic for a while, but it's going to get down here. And in this case, your alpha intercalated cells are working and they're going to be shooting H plus into the urine. And so you're going to have a decreased urine pH, decreased normal urine pH. Now, what will the potassium levels be? And this one's going to be tricky too. So I'm going to explain this to you. If you have failure of bicarb reabsorption in the proximal common tubule, guess what? You also have a decreased reabsorption. Remember that bicarb and sodium go together. So again, you have, let's erase this all. Again, we have increased sodium that makes it to the collecting duct because there's decreased uh, decreased absorption of bicarb plus sodium. So again, same as always, you should be used to this by now. Sodium goes in, potassium goes out, so now you have decreased K. Okay, and this was 5.5, it's greater than 5.5, this was also decreased. Finally, type 4 is called a hyperkalemic tubular acidosis. Okay, and this is due to aldosterone deficiency or resistance. 
if you don't if you have aldosterone deficiency there's less less of this and then there's less of this or also less of the H plus okay because of that you're gonna have well first right, first you can just tell from the name is hyperkalemic so there's gonna be increased potassium in the blood and it's because there's decreased secretion so this is the hyperkalemic one and then the urine pH urine pH will actually be still less than 5.5 okay now the way I remember this, the easiest way to remember this is to remember which one's type one, which one's type two, which one's type four. Okay, and there's gonna be a night, night, not safe for work mnemonic here. So if you're sensitive to anything sexual, please turn this off, leave the video. You have two more seconds to leave this video before I tell you. So the mnemonic here is for the distal, proximal, and then aldosterone dis deficiency or resistance. And this stands for a double penetration anal. Okay, and if you already know the order of these, if you know the sequence of these, if you know that if type 1 is distal, then you already know that distal has to be a problem with H plus secretion because that's remember distal is where H plus secretion happens and that's how you get acidosis if you can't secrete it. Or if you know that proximal, the problem is proximal, then you know that proximal, the what goes on is the bicarb reabsorption. So you know that if there's acidosis, it must be a problem in reabsorbing bicarb. And finally, if it's aldosterone, then it must be aldosterone resistance because aldosterone is what kicks that H plus out. So if you have an aldosterone resistance, H plus builds up again, you get acidosis. So just remember that mnemonic if you're not too offended by it, double penetration anal, and then you'll know which one's type one RTA, what a type two RTA is, what a type four RTA is. Okay, that's all the problems of the renal tubular tubules, renal tubular defects, renal tubular acidosis.